Hi there, I'm Kira Whelan and you're welcome once again to Ireland County by County, the programme which explores the sights and sounds, the places to visit, the culture and the food which our country has to offer. In this episode, we're journeying through time in a county known as the Land of Memories. Not a blade of grass grows here that isn't touched by history. From prehistoric forts from 5,000 years ago to ancient castles, we're gonna see it all. Lying in the West of Connacht, its entire eastern border runs gently along the River Shannon. In the next 30 minutes, I'll be witnessing the spectacular scenery along the only canopy treetop trail in Ireland. I'll be learning about some of the earliest settlers of Ireland in Rathcrohan, the home of Queen Maeve, the legendary ruler of Connacht. Experiencing firsthand the extraordinary mines here and learning about the overlooked yet fascinating role Roscommon played in the story of Ireland's most iconic monuments. And I'll be listening to music from a flute player known the world over, one of the very best Ireland has to offer, and maybe learning a note or two along the way. All this amidst the rolling hills of lush green grass and endless smiles on some of the friendliest folk you'll find anywhere in Ireland. Welcome to County Roscommon. Steeped in Irish culture, the name Roscommon itself reflects just how close history and the land of Roscommon are intertwined. Its name stems from the Irish word Ross, meaning a soft and wooded headland, and Comon, who was the founding bishop of the region, building his first monastery in the 5th century, a lovely blend of nature and history, in a way only Roscommon possesses. So Ross, come on, come on's wood. I'm beginning my journey in the northeast of the county, paying a visit to the wonderful Loch Key Forest Park, which is connected to the town of Boyle with a cycleway that passes Boyle Abbey and Boyle Harbour. With two magnificent castles, Loch Key is spoiled for history. Starting its life as the official residence of the McDermott's in the 1600s, Castle Island Castle still stands strong against the Sleepy River. Back on the shore, the brutalist style Moylerg Tower stands in place of the once Rockingham House. I'm going to chat to Louise, the manager here, about more than just castles. They also have some remarkable tunnels that were once used by the servants working for the Lord and Lady of the House. She's also going to tell me all about Ireland's only tree canopy walk. Louise, not only is this place ridiculously stunning, it's also steeped in history. Just behind me here is a stunning Castle Island. That's where it all started, going back to the 1100s, where you had the McDermott chieftains. And this is where they resided, out in Castle Island. In the Cromwellian time then, the lands were actually granted to the King Herman family. And they actually built Rockingham House right out on the grounds of where the Moiler Tower now stands. I suppose it's our history and our heritage and how the park came to be today. You can see the old 200 year old tunnels. So the idea behind them basically was that the servants wouldn't be seen and anyone paying like rents, that's where they would wait at the start of the first tunnel to be called up before they'd make their way into the house. Now one of them is slightly larger than the other one, and that was actually used to pump water years ago from the lake right up into the house itself. And it's where the deliveries by horse and cart would have been brought to the house years ago. And there's lots of little storerooms still in place in those servant tunnels. And how big is the park? It's 800 acres, you know, so it's quite substantial. There is a beautiful old church that we've managed to restore over the last few years. And we also have an old stable block we're looking to renovate. And what do people love to do when they come to visit? You can hire a bike if you like, or if you're a little bit tired, you can take an electric bike. You can also take a little rowing boat. You can actually row all the way out to Castle Island if you're feeling energetic. There's beautiful islands all around um, the back area here, so they can all be explored. So you can see it on land, on the water, but you can also experience it up above. We have our gorgeous tree canopy walk, and that's all part of the Loch Key experience. But then another high energetic way of being up in the trees is with the aerial course, uh, Zip It Forest Adventures. So again, you do your little hard part to get to the top of the trees and then you can zip line all the way down to the ground again. So it's a fabulous way to see the park. The Barra Brethney Way is made up of 12 walks from Cork to Cavan, and Roscommon has three of them. Suck Valley Way, Lung Loch Way, and Arigna Miners Way. There are also walking trails to explore in Schlievebourne, 
water activities galore at Bay Sports Water Park at Hudson Bay and the perfect place for animal lovers of all ages at Glen Deer Pet Farm. Now, driving a short hop, skipping a jump north, I'm excited to see Kilronan Castle, the former home of the wealthy Tennyson family. From the Irish, Kilronan, meaning Ronan's Chapel, the castle was aptly built in 1820 on the grounds of the 6th century Abbey of St. Ronan. Transforming a ruined house into a magnificent castle is a feat of construction that even the Trojans would envy. With their high ceilings and beautifully finished decor, Kilrona Castle really is one of the most luxurious castle hotels in Ireland. They also pride themselves on their food. And lucky for us, we're going to chat to executive head chef Daniel, who's going to share one of his dishes with us. Daniel, what an amazing place to come to work every day. What do you think it is that the American guests like most when they visit? It's to give them a taste of Ireland, a taste of produce that they wouldn't have over in America as much. So what are we going to cook today? Today, I'm going to do a very simple goat's meat terrine. Goat's meat is from Roscommon. It's very, very definitive goat meat. It's from a South African breed goat, which is very lean, so very nice and healthy. And we're going to do a few flowers, which we foraged around the grounds, a few leaves from the garden, and a few little bits and bobs I'll explain as I go along. It's a real art putting it all together. It is, it is. It's good fun. I shall present you the tools. Thank you, thank you. Pass the test. Mm-hmm. The flavours are so subtle, but it all just comes together. Daniel, um, thank you so much. No problem at all. Now I'm moving to the northeastern corner of the county to discover one of the most unique stories to be found within Roscommon at the Arigna Mining Experience. Less than a mile from Avrigna village lies the Arigna mine, which was once one of Ireland's most important mines, feeding the power grid with more than 55,000 tonnes of coal per year. But now that its store is depleted, don't think for a second that the local townspeople have run out of energy and love for their mine. Powering through obstacles in their way and digging deep into their pockets, they have made this mine a must-see tourist attraction for all those visiting Roscommon. You can hike here by its very own Arigna Miner's Way, a stunning stage of the marvellous Bera Brefni Way, taking walkers from Cork to Cavan, but whichever way you arrive, you won't be disappointed by what's inside. Jerry, did you start mining when you were a young fella? I started at 16 years of age, and it was a daunting experience the first day to enter a dark mine, and there could be 20 or 30 men working in the mine, 20 drawers and 20 face men, shovelers. And it wasn't like us walking in here today. It was very low. Very low and cramped. And when you went into the coal face, you lay on your side and you went up on your left hand side and you shoveled down six yards of coal. And you had that out about 11 o'clock and then you had your piece. Afterwards, you went in on the opposite side and you went down halfway and met the miner the other side and shoveled up the other coal. And that coal could go down to 10 inches in height. And if it went down below 12 inches, you couldn't use the coal cutting machine because it was 12 inches high. So then you had to revert back to your air pick. And it was price work. So you're paid by the ton then? You were paid by the ton. Did you enjoy it? I did. I, you adopt into it. When you're young, you can adopt into any situation. It was dusty. There's no doubt about it. It was a dusty job. But you got used to it. As simple as that. And what sort of men were mining? Who were you working with? Generally, they were all small farmers. We would have maybe 12 acres or 20 acres of land, going from work to work. And in them times, there was no talk of going on holidays or anything like that. <laughs> but you had maybe the few pound extra that the ordinary chap wouldn't have. You must have all been so close. You got to know the lads around you, and we relied on each other. You had to because there was a danger of rock falling. You got to know the different types of rock and when it was spitting whether to shore it up or not. And what did an average day look like? 
when you came into the mine? You started usually around 8 o'clock, but by the time you started in, it could be 10 past 8. And by the time you'd be in two and a half, three mile, it could be 8.30. So you roughly started within at the cold face at 8.30. If you had a good day, you could be out a bit early. And if you had a bad day and there was falls, you might be that bit later. That's why you said a prayer to your saviour on the way in. As some of the old miners said, you might meet him quicker than you think. So when you came to work in the morning, what sort of tools did you have with you? You paid for your own tools. You bought a number eight shovel and you bought a carbide lamp. That's all the drawer needed. The shoveler might need a number four shovel and he might need a two to four pound hammer and a wedge. And then was mostly his tools. And you bought carbide for your lamp. You brought a cold bottle of tea to work and you put it in your bag or a pocket. When you brought it in the morning, you wrapped it in a newspaper or a sock. And what can people see when they come to the experience? 400 years of mining. It's a way of preserving it. People don't realise until they come underground and see exactly how it was. That you are working in these low seams and hard to understand it until you get there to see it. Venturing south, making sure to enjoy Roscommon's 88 mile long shoreline with the River Shannon, I arrive in Strokestown Park and House, home to a museum dedicated to one of Ireland's most tragic and infamous disasters, the Great Famine. Considered one of the greatest social catastrophes of the 19th century, the Great Irish Famine irreparably changed our culture and psyche. With over 3 million Irish men, women and children either dying or emigrating due to the potato blight, this museum in Strokestown must be on every visitor's to see list. Considered to hold the largest collection of famine related material, the National Famine Museum here in Strokestown gives a real one of a kind insight into what life was like for an Irish person back in the mid 1840s. I'm going to take a look around and chat to John O'Driscoll about the most harrowing time in our history. Strokestown House was the home of the Mahan family. The Mahans came here in the mid 1600s. The first of them was Nicholas. Mahan. He was granted lands here for his services to Cromwell. Originally on the land there had been the O'Connor Row clan. They had been dispossessed, put off the land in the early 1600s. And here we are in the kitchen where at the time they were probably making their lobster soup but it was a very, very different story outside. Tell me about that. The majority of the population, the poorer working class people, did not own their land. They had rented plots of land, very small plots of land that they were sharing with many family members. They had very few rights. The landlord had all of the rights. They could be moved off their land very quickly. They were depending on the potato. In 1845, Phytophthora infestans or potato blight, a fungal disease, came into Ireland and spread rapidly through the country, wiping out potato fields. Within 24 hours, a whole field of potatoes could be wiped out. And tell me about the workhouses. Well, the workhouses were put in, in 1830, prior to the famine, to deal with the poverty issue in Ireland. People were taken in, given food and shelter and clothing. And then they were allocated out to work schemes. It could be drainage schemes, it could be land schemes, it could be road building, all of these work schemes that were created. There were certain schemes within the workhouses, like laundries and that, but it was just food and shelter in return for some work. If you couldn't pay your rent, then you could go to the workhouse or emigration was also an option. And lords were responsible for their tenants as well, to a certain amount. They couldn't just put them in the workhouse and forget about them. So any of their tenants who ended up in the workhouse, they had to pay an annual fee towards the upkeep to support. So this became a problem, I suppose, for the landlords. For less than that fee, sometimes half, you could emigrate that same person, a once-off payment paid passage became very strong then. There were more and more landlords paying passage. And when someone does come to visit the museum, what can they see? There are many information panels throughout explaining the circumstances of the Great Irish Famine. There are models on the Clahan or Rundell system. The gun which was used to shoot Major Dennis Mann is on display in the Famine Museum. And tell me about that, John. He was assassinated. After the tenants had gone, word did come back that one ship had sank. This wasn't the case, it was delayed coming in and it was shortly after that that Major Dennis Mahan was returning to his estate and he was assassinated. It was becoming quite violent in Ireland at the time. People were beginning to fight back, I suppose. This was a very important assassination. The first landlord shot during the famine. John, this place is so poignant and powerful. I think it's an absolute must visit for anybody coming to Roscommon. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. To help against the sobering famine archive, right outside sits a most splendid walled garden and woodlands. 
The six acres of gardens here are the perfect place to reflect on the sobering famine archive. With oaks 300 years old, this is certainly some of the best of natural Ireland. I'm continuing my journey south towards the state-of-the-art Roscommon Arts Centre in the town of Roscommon, where I'm going to meet a world-famous virtuoso. Credited with single-handedly making Roscommon recognised for its flute playing, Patsy Hanley is celebrated as one of the best flute players around the globe. His skill and dedication to the promotion of traditional Irish flute playing resulted in the long overdue Gratham Cole Award. Ireland's most prestigious traditional music award. I'm just hoping I can pick up enough skill for a song from my time with him. Oh, Patsy, that would cheer anyone up. Thank you so it's much. It's a happy tune. It's such an honour to be here and to have a private performance. I love the fact that in Roscommon, musicians can still come to a place like this and the music's kept alive really, isn't it? It's really important to have a place like this. You spent some time in Seattle as well, didn't you? I'd done three years at the Keol Cascadia. It's a traditional music weekend, transition of classes and concerts and things. People come from all over America to learn music. Everybody finds their place in it. If I'm going to learn how to play music, it should be from you. Would it be okay if I asked for a quick little lesson? No problem. Now is <laughs> the time to start. Now is the time to start. Do uh, most flutists start with a tin whistle? Uh, most people do, and especially the ones that start very young. There's a fair spread between the holes and a flute, you see, after your there's a lot of reaching for your finger. There's not a child in Ireland that did not have one of these That's right, yeah. in their hands. The only yeah. problem was, like in my house, yeah. the grown-ups gave them to them, but then they took them off fairly lively <laughs> when they started playing. I know that, yeah. Can you sound this note clearly? Now, they're fairly close to being in tune as well. Yes. <laughs> You're halfway down the keys already. <laughs> With Patsy's jigs and reels still playing in my ears, I'm staying in Roscommon Town to visit the town's own astounding vestige of history, Roscommon Castle. Even against the most violent parts of Ireland, the history of Roscommon Castle stands apart. From the 13th to the 16th century, the castle saw more than its fair share of battle as the O'Connor Kings of Connacht and the English armies took rule from the other four times. However, it would take two further wars between the Irish and English before the castle went into decay, when it was blown up on the orders of Cromwell. The decayed ruin stands with such power and elegance that no other castle in Ireland can claim. Aiding this is the stunning stretch of land that surrounds the castle. This is Loch Nanine Park. With 14 acres of serene grassland and a turlock, a disappearing lake as charming as it is rare, this park is the ideal spot to unplug from the busy world and relax. I wasn't joking when I said this county is full of history. Literally around every corner there's another gem. When you're driving through Roscommon Town, do yourself a favour and stop here at Roscommon Castle. It's open to the public, it's free and it is absolutely stunning. Outside the town of Tulsk, the archaeological complex of Rathcrohan is a landmark within Irish culture and history. As the headquarters of Connacht, it is one of the only six royal sites in Ireland, proving just how influential and powerful its sway over the land was. But Rathcrohan boasts more than a single fort, comprising an unparalleled 240 sites dating back over 5,500 years. From Neolithic to medieval to its very own gate to hell remains, Rathcrotton has it all. Rathcrotton played central stage in the Irish myth of Homeric proportions, the Tawn Bow Coolina. The story begins with idle pillow talk between Queen Maeve and her husband, becoming a bitter feud over who had the greater wealth. Never wanting to be bested, our regal rebel invaded the lands of Ulster for the possession of the famous Brown Bull of Cooley. Known for her insatiable lust and untamable ambition, Queen Maeve has inspired generations of storytelling. And I'm here to talk with Daniel to learn more about Connacht's famous warrior queen. Daniel, it's kind of hard to get your head around just how important this place is for history. Tell me about Rath Crotton. We're standing on top of Rathcrohan Mound in the middle of the archaeological landscape known as Rathcrohan. 
we're surrounded by 240 archaeological sites, 60 national monuments, all encased in a very tight area. And what was it used for? This is the royal site for Connacht, so this is the ancient territory of Connacht we're in, and this is basically the symbolic and the ceremonial capital of this region. So people from all around the province would have gathered here at different points in the year to celebrate, to marry off branches of families, to trade, and essentially basically to worship the land that's providing with the bounty. And what's underneath? We have evidence here that suggest could go back as far as early prehistory so you're talking somewhere in the region of about 5,000 years ago and every generation has placed some imprint upon this particular mound with the latest features uh, consisting of a very very large timber structure that was placed on top of this about 30 meters in diameter it would have basically stood as a landmark for the entire region something that could be walked to a focal point from the wider surrounds nearly like a steeple of a church. I love as well that probably one of your more interesting and one of your oldest pieces is one of your smallest. There was this beautiful little stone arrowhead. It was uh, uncovered at another site nearby to us here and it dates to the best part of 6,000 years ago. Probably used for hunting, probably used from the earliest communities ever to settle on this landscape. 6,000 years ago. That's just mind-blowing, isn't it? It is, and so many things have changed, but so many things have remained the same in many respects. I mean, the first communities that came here recognised Rathcrohan in its vicinity for the value that it had in sustaining them. And tell me about Queen Maeve. Queen Maeve would have ruled from here. She had many husbands, one of which was Alil, and herself and Alil had a hot and cold relationship, to put it mildly. The whole thing culminates with this great epic, this Thorn Bow Cullinor, Cattle Raid of Cooley, which is Ireland's national epic tale the equivalent of Beowulf or the Nibelunga lead or the Iliad or the Odyssey for the Greeks. And if there's one place in Ireland that ties history and mythology together, it's here. This is our national epic and it begins and ends at Rathcrohan. From a Queen's Fort to King's House, I'm finishing my tour of Roscommon in the town of Boyle, birthplace of celebrities like internationally beloved actor-comedian Chris O'Dowd, and dazzling star of the silver screen, Maureen O'Sullivan. Famous for her role as Jane in the Tarzan series, the exhibition of her life in King's House is duly graceful and engaging. At his death in 1636, Englishman Sir John King had established his family with such dominance that they would remain one of the wealthiest and influential families in Ireland for the next 300 years. Throughout their lengthy time in Boyle, the King family shaped and moulded Irish history, leaving fingerprints most clearly during times like the Famine, Civil War and the formation of the Irish Free State. However, it all came to an end in the early 20th century when their fabulous Georgian house was converted briefly into an army barracks for the fierce Connacht Rangers, the local Irish regiment of the British Army. With the withdrawal of British forces following their defeat in the Irish War of Independence, King House began to fall into ruin. Thanks to the incredible work of Roscommon County Council in the late 1980s, this house has been lovingly restored to its former glory. With help from local craftspeople using traditional techniques, it represents the enduring sense of community spirit and pride throughout the county. And if there's one person to chat to about that, it's Mary Lavin. Mary King House, named after the King family, tell me all about them. John King came here to Ireland in 1604. He was awarded the deeds to the Boyle Abbey and its lands, 4,127 acres of land, for his services to the Crown. The house is absolutely stunning. When was it built? This house was built in 1730 by Sir Henry King. He was a landlord and a member of Parliament. He lived here with his wife Isabella, who was a sister of Icon Powers Court and family for just less than 50 years. What do visitors love when they come to King House? We have the house itself. We have the Connacht Rangers Museums. We have the Maureen O'Sullivan exhibition upstairs. We have the jail cells and four museums in the house. So quite a lot to see here. And who was Maureen O'Sullivan? Maureen O'Sullivan was born in Boyle on the 17th of May, 1911. Later in life, she got the privileged position of Jane Parker in Tarzan. We all remember that because she was there uh, for a long number of years. From Boyle to Hollywood and then back again, she did come back. Maureen came back here on the 7th and 8th of August 1988, accompanied by her second husband, John Cutchie. Maureen gave a speech that day 
And she said, the wonderful countryside I lived in will remain forever in my heart. I've come full circle. Now I have returned home to Boyle. I hope you've enjoyed our visit to the historic and stunning destinations that County Roscommon has to offer. Join us next time as we continue our journey through Ireland, county by county. Ireland County by County is brought to you in part by Roscommon County Council, Roscommon Tourism, Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs, the National Parks and Wildlife Services, Board Bia, the Irish Food Board, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. CIE Tours, sharing the magic of Ireland for nearly 90 years.